Welcome back. Ryan Laws, the former Sheffield Wednesday manager, longest serving Owls boss in the past 25 years, uh, rejoins us. He survived just over three years, three years and one month in the Hillsborough hot seat. And uh, serving uh, Sheffield journalism even longer than that is Don Howson of Yorkshire Live, formerly of the Sheffield Star. We're talking about Tony Pulis's appointment as Sheffield Wednesday manager. A bit of subliminal advertising just uh, occurring now and again. Brian, I don't know if you recognise that uh, from a good few years ago, but Christmas is coming. Christmas is coming. Yeah. You reckon? You just reminded me, actually. I've run out of my books. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you burned them. You said they burn well. Yeah, they do. Well, they do. But on a cold night, the last I, I actually I timed it. It was about 30, 32 minutes. It lasted, so it was decent. Is it? Well, I've, I've got about five. I've got five in my office, so uh, we'll be all right for Christmas fuel. That's great. Thanks very much. Oh. It, I mean, Christmas fuel prices are quite heavy now uh, for this sort of weight of fuel. I think we're talking about five quid on Amazon at the moment, something like that. Anyway, enough of that. Um, okay. <laughs> Tony Pulis says uh, his dream would be uh, Sheffield Wednesday emulating Sheffield United and Chris Wilder. Now, there's a bold statement, if ever there was one. And I happen to know that the two of them are very pally. They've got great respect for each other. But that really was a declaration, wasn't it, Brian? Did it surprise you that he went that far? No, not he, listen. He's a, he, he know he knows he knows what to say and what what buttons to press and to wind people up and also to actually, you know, stimulate the the, the thing that has always been talked about in Sheffield. So um, you know, he's he's, he's a very wise man, and uh, that will win a lot of fans over just by the pure fact that he's he's suggesting already that this is what he wants to do and. Um, you know, he wants to knock Sheffield United off their perch in the Premier League, which is uh, exactly what the fans want to hear, really. I suspect fans on both sides of the city would have appreciated that to an extent. But where I think there will always be con controversy in Sheffield football, and I will never go near a column that discusses it, but I'm going to mention it here, is his assertion that Sheffield Wednesday are uh, traditionally a bigger and better supported club than uh, Sheffield United. I couldn't possibly comment on that, but that's what he was implying there, Brian, what he was saying. Yeah, um, you know, and he's, I think he's got every right, hasn't he? Um, I think it's, uh, it, it's historically, I think most people would say that Wednesday are, are a bigger club. Um, it just happens to be Sheffield United are in the higher echelons of the Premier League. So they've got the higher esteem, they've got the, the, you know they they're wearing, it, wearing the crown at the moment in terms of where where they are in terms of uh, uh, position, but in terms of size, I think most people would say that Sheffield Wednesday are a bigger club. Mm. Most people would say. I'm not saying. Don the house, and you can safely say it's all right for you, you guys, isn't it? Brian's absolutely right. I haven't got anything else to add. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think it's great that, that that he has gone in there and he set a target, hasn't he? And, and, and I think that's it's a good objective to have anyway, straight from the off, isn't it? That um, the bragging rights in the city have moved over to the red half. Um, certainly under Chris Wilder, they have done. He's done an outstanding job. Uh, and the balance of power has shifted and he's wanted to turn that around. And... and who knows in 12 months' time where things are going, um, they could be in the same division. Mm. There's a big gap in support, though, at the moment. Well, at least there was uh, when we had fans in stadiums. Typically, Sheffield Wednesday, 20,000. Uh, Sheffield United, 30, you know, filling the ground, albeit in different positions. Um, let's have a look at certain positions in the team. I mean, Brian, you first, and you see a lot of uh, Sheffield Wednesday, as you do Nottingham Forest and other of your former clubs, because you work on BBC Radio uh, as a co-commentator, and you've drawn the short straw, because you were just telling us before we came back on, that you've volunteered for a certain away match, thinking, I think, that it was a home game. I did. I, I, I did drop the, the proverbial, yeah, the... Uh... I, I was on the understanding that I thought it was um, Sheffield Wednesday versus Swansea. Little did I know it was Swansea versus Sheffield Wednesday. So <laughs> I committed 
So I will uh, continue my commitment with BBC Radio, on the, and I will uh, I will be there for the game, and looking forward to it. Well, more more homework in future, more homework in future. <laughs> looking ahead, I've got Sheffield Wednesday v Stoke. I better check that one as well. That wouldn't be very far to to go to Stoke. That's Tony's first home game. Uh, it would oh, be incredible. Wouldn't it? it would be. Yeah. Incredible, isn't it? Um, you know how things just uh, spill out and, uh, and put things together, and all of a sudden you've got Tony playing against his former club as well, which he will absolutely irritate him to death if he loses that game. So, um, you know, he, he'll want he'll, he'll want to play well, but he'll, he'll want to win the game, of course. And uh, you know, it, it'll be a big, strong test because Stoker actually starting to show some signs of recovery uh, from having a tremendous, uh, awful season last year. And um, they start to show little signs of recovery, uh, little green shoots of, uh, of recovery for them. Um, but Wednesday, um, you know, should have the upper hand, I have to say. It's to Tony and Noah Stoke inside out and, uh, and he'll try and get one over them for sure. Yeah, uh, uh, Stephen Fletcher is doing well for Stoke, as he did for Sheffield Wednesday during his career, particularly last season. Strong striker who's getting goals as, as, as well at the moment. Can we can look at the um, goalkeeping uh, position, uh, which has been a, a source of controversy and debate for, for, for a while now. Um, one of Tony Pulis's most forthright comments on coming in was that if uh, Kieran Westwood, displaced and out in the cold, now being brought back from the cold, if he was available, presumably fully fit, etc., uh, that he'd be looking to pick him. That was a, a really bold declaration, Brian, for starters, do you think? Yeah, well, listen, he, uh, like I said to you right from the beginning, he'll look at all the tools available to him and he'll get the best out of what he's got there. You know, he's not going to pick sides or... or or, um, you know, agree with somebody's decision from the past, that he, he will make his own decision um, purely on facts. And uh, he will, if he's available, he was one of the best keepers in the division. And I think most people will agree that, uh, you know, everybody's surprised why he's not actually involved. Um, but something's gone on. We don't, we obviously, I... I don't know what's going on in the dressing room or within the football club between both parties, but there's certainly been a split, and hence the reason why he's been froze now. This is a great opportunity. Tony going in, he can freshen things up, bring him back into the fold. He's a character for sure. He's a leader on the park. You know that he organises his defence, and and he keeps clean sheets. He's, he's proven that. Um, the only the, the only negative will be he's not played a, he's not played a lot for a lot of time. He's probably yeah. trained, but in terms of match match fitness, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, that would be a, a big call to pull him straight back in. Um, I'm not so sure about that one, Alan. What, what no. would you do in his situation, Brian? It, you know, he's not played any football for the under-23s or, or the first team in a year. So he's only trained this week so far. He's, but we know how experienced Westwood is, how many matches he's played and everything. But what would you do in this situation? Well, going into a new club, I'd, I'd, I'd look at everything. And, um, and I think he would be certainly under the radar um, and... I'd be focusing on on finding out and talking to the, the lad for sure and, and finding out exactly what, what's gone on. Is his mindset still wanting to play for Sheffield Wednesday? He's been out, he's been frozen out so long. He could be one of those that he's give up. We don't know. But if he's actually still got the appetite, he's still. A, he, I'm sure he's, he's still a good goalkeeper. Um, but he would bring him in the fold because he is a strong character, and I think he's well liked by most of the players. OK, well, Dom, if I just throw it back to you you on this, because we, we, we've talked about this goalkeeping situation, we've written about it, and I think it's fair to say that in principle, both of us, certainly uh, I have, have backed the, the previous two managers, not against Kieran Westwood, but pro to very good younger goalkeepers who are the future of the club. And I could see logically why they were giving Cameron Dawson and Joe uh, Wildsmith their head. But in fairness as well, Dom, 
neither of these two have really grasped the opportunity, have they? No, they haven't, Alan. I think they, they've shown in, in some games that they're up to it, but then we've seen with them both that they've made costly mistakes. You look at Cameron Dawson, the three errors at Rotherham, um, that they cost the team big time on the night. And, and we've seen it with, with Joe as well, that uh, you know those errors have crept into his game. And I think we also have to move away from the narrative of, they're two young goalkeepers. They're not actually. Um, and they've both played over 50 odds now in the championship. And they're both in that, you know, they're both 24, 25. And um, so you, I don't think we can use the, you know, they're relatively young, inexperienced. I think we have to stop with that, really. Um, and we, we've got to judge it on what we've seen. And, and so far, they haven't, over a, 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 the course of a season, they haven't delivered for Wednesday enough clean sheets. It, 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 I have sympathy for Cameron Dawson and the, there have been times where he's been thrown into really difficult situations uh, and, and where the team have lacked confidence, there's been injuries, the back four, the back five have constantly chopped change. So it doesn't make life easy for a goalkeeper. Um, but I think Brian's absolutely right that, you know, he, he's looked at it and he's weighed everything up um, as Tony Pewis. And it, it just seems a waste to me where you've got a, a player on the sidelines. Why use him? Why not see what he's got left? Locker, really. You know, he's coming to the twilight of his career. And I would also say he's another one who's got a point to prove. That's what he has now. He's another one that I think he's desperate to get back out there, Kieran Westwood. And you go off the the videos from the club, the pictures this week of them training. You know, he'd he, he like just to be training with the senior boys because he's been forced to train with the, the under-23s, um, you know, over the, the last few months. Yeah, um, apologies for the odd glitch in sound and, uh, and and picture. It's what we have to live with, folks, on Zoom at the moment. But just going back to, to Brian on the goalkeeping issue, I, I, I've seen one or two comments on social media to the extent of, oh, is it really fair to these uh, younger goalkeepers, not young goalkeepers, but take it dogs, point, younger keepers, that the new managers come in and immediately look uh, to pick uh, the senior keeper or bring back into the fold of the senior keeper. I look at that slightly differently, Brian. I think it could be good motivation for both Dawson and Wildsmith. What do you think? Yeah, I, listen, Dom's right. They're, they're not young. You can't class them as you know young, inexperienced goalkeepers. They both have played a lot of games. You're right. And, you know, neither have really sort of classed as number one. They've neither taken that opportunity um, but bringing, bringing him back into the fold, I think they, I think they were a tight unit when before he was frozen out, and maybe that you know bringing him back in, I, I, th I think we'll get that togetherness which goalkeepers do, um, and they'll you know support each other, um, and, and it'd be nice for even a senior player, senior goalkeeper, supporting even the younger goalkeepers, uh, even if they're playing. You know, just to bring him in for that reason. Um, but certainly he will, well, he's certainly be lifting a few eyebrows, won't he, um, uh, bringing him back in to the fold. But I, I think it's the right move. I think it's a good move. Um, you know, and now if Tony, in the end, falls out with him, then that's three managers that are in succession that have fallen out with a goalkeeper, then, you know, then that's really times up, isn't it? Yeah, 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 fair point. Yeah, and I think there's a lot at stake for uh, everybody in, in, in bringing Kieran Westwood uh, back into the fold, and I hope it works out. Let's uh, go to, well, we'll go to the other end of the team, the strikers, where there's a, a you've, you've got a depth of goalkeeping talent. I mean, in terms of strikers, it's really threadbare. You've only got as really effectively as many strikers as there are goalkeepers, Don, at uh, Sheffield Wednesday at the moment. Well, you could make a case. I mean, Gary Monk, I think, regarded or thought that um, they had sort of five on the books um, with Jack Marriott, Jordan Rhodes, um, Elias Kuchunga, Callum Patterson and Josh Windass. Um, but Jack Marriott has really struggled since coming to Wednesday. Um, so uh, we, and we don't know 
Tony Pulis's feelings yet on him um, and whether he's going to get a fair, you know, sort of crack of the whip. Um, Callum Patterson, he's suggested, you know, at his uh, unveiling the other day, he doesn't see him necessarily as a striker. That one did surprise me, that omission, when you think that um, if if Tony Pulis wants to go down the route of when they've got to be more, you know, direct and you know, he doesn't want them to get bullied and you may see the you know, that long ball style, then the, of, of the strikers that Wednesday have got, Callum Patterson is the only big physical guy who you'd say could perform as a focal point in this team. Um, but who knows? It might be that Tony Pewis might be the manager to get a tune out of Jordan Rhodes, but we have been saying that for, for years, haven't we? So I, I would suspect that Jordan Rhodes will come back into the fold and he'll be given a sort of uh, last chance saloon, last opportunity to stake a claim. Um, and the, yeah, you know, I mean, the only strikers he name-checked were Josh Windass and Jordan Rhodes. So that's, I mean, that's probably telling really of his mindset. And I think he's maybe made it clear there that I think in January, Wednesday, they're going to be in the market for a striker. Oh, without a doubt, I would have thought. Um, Josh Windass, to me, impresses uh, me because I think he's a real nagging threat to the opposition throughout a game, regardless of, you know, how a team is playing. But Brian, uh, how do you see Tony setting up tactically and how do you see him counteracting this apparent lack of threat in his forward positions? Yeah, I, I, I mean, um, that's one of sort of the conversations I had. I'm not going to obviously disclose what we were talking about, but it was the lack of goals um, and, you know, creativity within the, the last third of the pitch. I think the thing is with, with Tony, he, he, he's quite a specialist in that, that um, he does the numbers game. He, you know, he, he will specifically uh, give, um, you know, ammunition to the strikers, he will specifically say to the wingers, you've got to cross the ball. You've got to supply. I expect this. I expect that. And uh, that's one of the things that probably frustrates the strikers. It frustrates me when I see opportunities maybe for crosses going in and it doesn't go in. And, you know, where are the strikers going to get the goals from when you're in the last third? Other than manufacturing something on their own. Well, Jordan Rhodes is not going to do that. and may do that now and again. But he's in, 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 in shown in the past, if you supply him, he, he generally scores goals. And if you get crosses coming in the box, he's got a habit of getting on the end of things. And, and that's not a bad habit. So he will make sure if, if those things are, are available to him in, ter in terms of resources where the wide men are, are supplying the strikers, then he'll start to expect the strikers to start scoring goals because that's one of the strikers' probably gripes. If you ever spoke to them, they say, I don't get enough supply. I don't get enough opportunities to get to a goal. And I think that's probably frustrating for them. Yeah, it's not just the strikers, though. I think you know, you, it's the whole team that have got to start chipping in. It's six goals in 11 matches in the Championship. Two of them have been penalties. And one yeah. of them has been a, you know, an own goal. And what was it? I think they've only scored two from open play. Uh, but also, it's the home form as much as anything. You know, I know we still have the situation of where we don't know when fans are going to be back. But with or without fans, the home form has been wretched. And so I, I've got no doubt that that's going to be really high, uh, you know, at the top of his priority list. Um, but I mean, it'd be interesting at Preston to see you know, with him saying that there's another couple of players who picked up injuries, how they line up and what formation they're going to go with. As since we you know, since lockdown, um, we came out the first one and the restart back in June. Wednesday have exclusively pretty much played three five two, but if they're without some key defenders, will he have to go to a back four um, on Saturday? As an example, we we don't know. I mean, what I mean, what system do you think he's going to go with, Brian? What do you think he'd do? Um, you know, I there, there was there were conversations that we had about you know went through all the players. As he as he he spoke to me, he, he's asked me questions about the players, and he's asked questions of other people that have 
uh, are involved in the football club, outside the football club, knowledgeable football uh, managers who have, have uh, know and understand the, the actual squad. So he's done a lot, a lot of homework and he will have a formation in, in his mind and, you know, and he'll expect them to get on with it. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he has, a, if he goes with a back four, he does like a back four. And it wouldn't surprise me if he starts with a back four for sure. And, uh, you know, whether it's a three-man midfield, I don't know. Um, but he, he will look at, and I think he's right. Uh, you know, Patterson he, straight away he actually said he didn't believe that he is a natural striker. He's brilliant at getting into in, into the box as a third man running and being aggressive and winning his headers. Um, so if the cross comes in, he would probably expect him to get in the box and and to to get on the end of things. But as as a link up and as a main striker target. I don't, I'm not sure whether he believes that that's his position. One thing you can say, though, about Callum Patterson that should suit Tony Pulis is he's got a hell of a good long throw on him. And uh, Tony, with Rory Delap and others over the years, has really <laughs> profited from that. I, I, once, I, I was t talking to him on, um, uh, the other day about, you know, when Rory Delap was obviously a weapon uh, as such at Stoke and I was at Burnley as manager and uh, you know we're trying trying all sorts to, to try and outwit him uh, and uh, try and stop this this uh, this weapon because it was absolutely crucial to Stoke at the time in the Premier League they were score more goals than anybody from set plays it was frightening in terms of defending it because not, no players really enjoyed doing it um, so I had I had uh, the audacity to uh, speak to the uh, commercial department, the football league, uh, and found out, try to find out about the boarding uh, around the perimeter of the of the pitch, and how far a distance should these actually boardings be away from the actual touchline. Uh, so apparently it was 1.5 meters. So I made the groundsman the night before uh, to. Bring the perimeter of the, the, the boardings right close to the uh, to the um, uh, to the touchline, and, uh, and Tony Pula spotted it immediately, um, and made a little bit of a complaint, but was told and assured by the referee that it was actually in the right it was the right thing. So we had boardings all the way around, apart from one little gap where you had to walk through. Lo and behold, they had a throw in. Rory Durant actually ran through the gap launched one in from about 40 yards like a missile and scored. So it was a complete waste of time. <laughs> it's a great story. It's a lovely story that, how it backfired. I bet Tony Pulis respected you all the more for that. Um, I just wonder about the pitch dimensions at Hillsborough as well, because one thing that Gary Monk did do during the summer was he narrowed the pitch. Uh, he felt that it would suit Sheffield Wednesday more to do that. Um, I'm not so sure that's worked for them because you were talking about the lack of crosses uh, and achieving width. Do you think, Brian, hazarding a guess, that Tony would look maybe to restore the previous dimensions or what? Well, if he's going to bring the throw... Well, listen, I'm not saying he is, but if he, he does bring or use Patterson uh, to launch the balls in in the last third of the pitch as a set play, um, then the closer they're in, I suppose, the better. Um, so he probably would quite relish that. Um, I'm not so sure he would dabble around with the, with the, you know, the actual size of the pitch. Um, it's a, you know, like I said, he keeps it very, very simple. He, he doesn't overcomplicate things. I mean, I, I was desperately trying to win games, trying to keep uh, Burnley in the Premier League. So I was desperately trying all sorts of things to, uh, yeah. to, uh, to use resources to try and win a game. So yeah. I, I don't think you'll touch anything on the pitch, not, certainly not early on. OK, well, just two final topics to, to sort through. One is the captain, or at least he is at the moment, Barry Bannon, and the importance to him. Tony Pulis at his unveiling was, you know, very specific about how much he uh, rates, uh, how highly he rates Barry Bannon. And the other thing is the coaching uh, set up. There's been movement on that uh, as we speak, uh, Don. 
Craig Gardner's come in. That that was expected, uh, really. You know, Tony said that he likes to have a young coach, uh, you know, as part of his team. And I think that Craig Gardner, the impression I get is he's going to be that link between the first team and the academy and that he's going to be the one that will be keeping an eye on, you know, the kids that Wednesday have got coming through, you know, in the under-23s and who they think might be ready to step up. And we've actually seen this week with the amount of injuries that Wednesday have got, um, Josh Dewoodoo and Ryan Galvin, who I've seen a lot, that they've been part of the first team setup. They've been training this week with them. I think that's needs most. But um, yeah, I mean, that's going to be something else to keep an eye on in that, you know, Tony Pugh is, is a guy who um, he knows that he needs results. But at the same time, you know, will he have the luxury of bringing in sort of youngsters? Um, you know, will he be able to integrate and get some into that senior team? You know, that that's going to be something I think, you know, that we're, we're going to watch out for. But yeah, I think there's still a bit of work to be done on coaching staff in that I think he's, he still want to bring in another couple of his own people, really. And it is, it's, it's Fred Bear at the moment with the amount who left uh, last week with Gary Monk that, yeah, you know, Wednesday do need to bring in some more coaching staff as a matter of urgency, I would suggest. Yeah, David Kemp's constantly been mentioned to me by people in the game. It's not been confirmed yet. Wouldn't be the greatest surprise, Brian. No, um, Kemp goes with him most places and... Uh... I think you've got it's a fair bet that Hill will be joining um, joining Tony as well for sure. Um, you know he respects him and uh, uh, and he, you know he knows that what Tony is like as well. So he, they've worked really well together. So I, like I said, I don't think that would be a surprise that Tony Camp comes in. No, there were all these doom mongers saying, "Oh, that's it for Barry Bannon at this club. Our best player. He'll be off now that Tony Pulis has come in." So much nonsense, really, because. A quality player is a quality player. You'd expect him to have as big a rating, Brian, of Barry Bannon as the previous managers at uh, Sheffield Wednesday. Yeah, uh, listen, Bar Barry Bannon is an excellent player. Um, you know, that's another area that we did speak about. And um, can he knows he's, he's, he's one of the best players in the, in the, in the club. He's, he's, he's brave in, in terms of wanting the ball. You know, no matter how difficult things can be, uh, if the team's not doing well, he's, all, he's never hides. He's always looking for the ball um, and he's reliable with it, you know. Um, and he's got a little bit of fire in his belly. And, uh, and I think um, he, him getting the armband has probably uh, helped him a little bit as well. Um, I think he's enjoyed it. He's relished it. Um, it's when you, you know, I think one of the things that I've noticed, um, uh, Alan and, and Dom, and I don't know how you think about that, it was quite interesting when there's no crowd, it's what we hear off the pitch, oh, sorry, on the pitch, um, because when the crowd's there, you don't hear verbally players uh, communicating with each other and how are they communicating. And I think one of the things that Barry Bannon is quite clearly, he's, he's a communicator and he will... He'll have a go at a few players if they've not pulled them, you know, if they've not done the jobs properly. Um, that's been evident, and I think, uh, you know, Tony will like that. That has been uh, evident to, to us, uh, Dom, probably more than you than me with the headphones on. You don't hear everything, but is it something that you've, you've noticed yourself? Yeah, definitely. He is one of uh, Wednesday's most vocal players on the pitch. There's uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, it, it was interesting that uh, Tony Pulis um, said that he was going to have a conversation with Bannon um, at the press on Monday about the captaincy. And so at this point, we're still not sure whether Barry Bannon will definitely be keeping the armband. Um, but I would say that if you if you were to take it off Barry Bannon... I don't really, when I look around the Wednesday team, I don't see that many other candidates. I don't see many other guys who you would call natural leaders, uh, arguably maybe Shay Dunkley, but we still don't know when Shay Dunkley is going to be fit. Uh, but, you know, Tom Lees has had it before. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I would have... I would have thought that you know Barry Bannon deserves to keep the captain's armband, but Tony Pulis may think differently. We're going to find out very <laughs> in the next few days. 
Yeah, have you any thoughts on that, Brian? Anybody there, there that you think potentially could be a leader for the for the new manager or captain for the new manager? I think, um, you know, I think Barry's probably the right man for the job at this moment in time. When you look at, you know, the other players, they're quite quiet. Um, you know, you generally get, a, you know, the captain's armband normally goes to the centre-half or a midfield player. Um, but... In the, even in the back four or back five, there's no one really there who, in, uh, no respect, inspires you uh, as a leader. They certainly they might lead as an example, but they don't. They're not going to be that other part of the leadership of, of organisation and, and communication, um, which is another part of the armour as a captain. You know, it's okay being a leader shown by example, which is great. But actually, what you need also need is, is that communication side as well. It's vital. Right. Brian, thanks very much indeed, Tom. Uh, gratitude to, to you as well. Certainly no lack of communication uh, on this programme and some, uh, some great stories along the way. Appreciate both of you uh, coming on. Brian Laws and Dom House. And thank you to you for watching. And by way of balance, I can promise a famous former Sheffield United player on this show next week. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.